Over the past couple of years, Kit Guru has travelled the world learning about Intel's Meteor Lake technology, now named Intel Core Ultra. We've been to Israel, where they fab chips. We've been to Malaysia, where they package chips. We've been to Las Vegas for CES. <laughs> But it was only once we returned here to the UK that we were able to get our hands on this Asus ZenBook 14 OLED laptop. This Asus ZenBook 14 OLED sports the new Intel Core Ultra 7155H processor. And while I don't think much of the naming scheme, the processor itself is certainly interesting. And the laptop, it's lovely. So let's take a closer look at the laptop and see what lies within this curiously named Ponder Blue housing. Unleash the power of RTX 4080 Super with superior liquid cooling. This Asus ZenBook 14 OLED was sent to us by Intel as an example of an Intel Core Ultra 7155H processor in an Intel Evo laptop, i.e. it meets all of Intel's standards for a high-end laptop. So let's start by looking at the Asus part of the equation, and then we'll move on to the Intel side of things. The name of the laptop pretty much gives away the game 14 OLED, 14 inch screen, OLED display, looks absolutely lovely. The screen is rated at 3K and is touch screen, has a resolution of 2880 by 1800, 120 hertz refresh. I've currently got it set as you can see to 150% scaling because at 100% the icons are absolutely tiny. The screen is rated at 400 nits and can boost to 500 temporarily, so to my mind this is not an HDR screen. Furthermore, under these kind of lights it looks absolutely great, but when you step outside in bright sunlight, it's a different story. But I'm okay with that, I don't generally sit in a park bench with a laptop. However, it might be worth bearing that in mind. The price of this laptop is a little hazy. There are two very similar models on sale by Asus, one at a penny under £1,300 and one a penny under £1,400. However, this laptop sits between the two of them. It has a Core Ultra 7 with 32 gigabytes of memory, whereas according to the Asus website, it should be 16 gig with the Ultra 7 or 32 gig with the Ultra 9. So I suppose that means this laptop should be priced around 1350 pounds, including VAT. It's a thin and light laptop, very thin, as you can see, when you close it down, 14.9 millimeters on the thickness, i.e. a fraction under 15 mil. It's also light. 1.25 kilos, and then we have this USB-C 65 watt power adapter, which weighs 240 grams. And I've been using this adapter because obviously that is not a UK plug. So one and a half kilos all up. As I mentioned, it's a touch screen. It comes with this Asus Pen 2.0. I think from memory, they're about a hundred pounds, but could be wrong. So if you like doing handwriting on touch screens in the appropriate apps, that's great. Also, it doesn't have an ethernet port, but then thin lights of this size, there's no space for them. So it has a USB 3 type A adapter to ethernet. Beyond that, when it comes to ports and connectors, we don't have a whole lot to look at. There's nothing on the front and nothing on the back. On the left hand side, we have a single USB 3 type A. Logically, that's gonna be for a mouse. Although as mentioned, if you're using ethernet, that's gonna go there. Those three ports are actually vents for cooling. Everything else is on this side, where we have two Thunderbolt 4 Type-C's, an HDMI 2.1, and an audio jack. To my mind, those ports and connectors are just about acceptable. I don't mind the absence of ethernet, and as I say, there's a dongle. Clearly, mouse and keyboard can be connected wirelessly, either Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. And I, for example, use an SD card reader to transfer video files. We've got two USB 4s, so I don't have an issue there. That's a whole load of connectivity but it's perfectly possible that your setup requires different configuration, in which case I suspect you'll be buying a dock to go this laptop. The SSD is a one terabyte SanDisk SN560, that's PCI Express Gen 4. The memory is interesting, we have 32 gigabytes of LP DDR5X rated at 8533. That memory is in dual channel. LP memory is strange stuff, it stands for low power, but it definitely has something else going on. We've seen this in previous generations of laptops, where LP memory, although it's dual channel, we know it for a fact, it can sometimes appear as quad channel. It's as though the memory's been sliced up, and the memory in this laptop 
appears to be divided up as eight four gigabyte chunks. So 32 gig of extremely fast LP DDR5X memory. And that undeniably is helping performance. The graphics in Core Ultra 7 are Intel Arc, and that's pretty much all I can tell you about the graphics. GPU-Z doesn't have a clue what the graphics are doing, and the Intel web page for this processor is also slightly vague on the subject. However, balanced against that, we know full well Intel Arc is the latest form of Intel graphics, and we also know that the graphics drivers apply equally to desktop and also to mobile. And as Dominic has covered recently, Intel has been busy updating their desktop drivers, and that's really helped performance, particularly in games. If you cast your mind back to my launch day review last October, you'll probably remember I wasn't especially keen on either the A750 or the A770, simply due to the number of software problems. Well, Intel has been hard at work and is promising some significant improvements with its latest drivers. So today we'll be putting that to the test. So we have every confidence that Intel Arc in Core Ultra 7 is a perfectly sound graphics platform. As to how well it performs, well, we'll come to that in a bit. Before we move on to our performance charts, let's see if we can figure out what the processor is doing. This new Intel Core Ultra 7 155H has three types of cores. We have 6P or performance cores, 8E or efficiency cores, and now two LP or low power or extra efficient cores. In total, we have 22 threads. This laptop is controlled by the Maya Azu software, and there are three power settings. Let's start with standard mode which is the mode we used for our testing. You can see PL1 is 64 watts and PL2 the sustained power 36 watts. How does that manifest itself in the real world? Initially the processor boosts to 3.6 gigahertz on the P cores and 2.8 gigahertz on the E cores but then it settles down to approximately 2.1 gigahertz on all cores. The initial boost is to 67 watts and a package temperature of 103 degrees Celsius. Sustained power is 32 watts and a temperature of 89 degrees. The explanation for this behavior is that in standard mode, the cooling is relatively quiet and sounds like this. And we see the final Cinebench score on this run of 9,408. In performance mode, the PL1 power setting remains the same at 64 watts, but PL2 increases from 36 to 44 watts. This has very little effect on clock speeds. We see the same boost, and then the P&E core settle down to about 2.1 gigahertz. However, the initial boost phase sees a temperature of 108 degrees, and then a sustained temperature of 75 degrees, which is significantly cooler than standard mode. However, this comes at the expense of extra fan noise, which sounds like this. The final Cinebench score in this run 10,275, which is a handy increase on standard mode. But the cooling noise is significant. The third mode is Whisper mode, and interestingly we see PL1 is still 64 watts, however the sustained PL2 is only 30 watts. This means the boost phase is much the same as the other modes, and the sustained phase is very slightly lower. 2.0 GHz on the P cores, 1.9 to 2.1 on the E cores. Clearly performance is being impacted, and we see this in the final Cinebench score of a mere 6,727. On the plus side, Whisper Mode lives up to its name and the laptop is practically inaudible. If you're looking for a new chair, then you should definitely check out Boolies. I'm currently sat on their Ninja Pro Gaming Chair, which is one of three models from their gaming series alongside the Elite and the Master. So if you're looking for something new to stick in your setup that you can sit on and game and work, then I recommend definitely checking out Boolies.co.uk. And now let's turn to our performance chart, starting with Cinebench R23 Multicore. And you'll see the ZenBook 14 OLED is pretty much in the middle of the charts. Performance is perfectly decent and pretty much in line with the power draw of the processor. In Cinebench R23 Single Core, again, the Core Ultra 7 155H is in the middle of the chart, perhaps slightly below the middle. 
and we can see this comes down to power consumption. In Cinebench R23, it is a sustained 30 watts and a resulting approximately 2.4 gigahertz. But as you've seen, the clock speed is highly dynamic. In 7-zip version 22 benchmark, the laptop is pretty much in the middle of the chart. Again, this is more or less down to the power draw of the processor. Ada 64 memory bandwidth, the ZenBook 14 OLED is up the top of the chart by a significant margin. The memory in this laptop is incredibly fast, rated at 8533, and it trounces the competition. On the other hand, in 3D Mark CPU profile, the Core Ultra 7 155H does surprisingly poorly. And in 3D Mark Time Spy, just the CPU score, the laptop does really poorly. In 3D Mark Time Spy, looking at the overall score, so both CPU and GPU, it pulls its socks up and moves up the charts slightly. Moving on to gaming, so here we're looking at both the Core Ultra 7 155H and also the Intel Arc graphics. We see in Far Cry 6 at full HD, the score is highly unimpressive, an average of 25 FPS and a 1% low of 7 FPS. You'll note we're comparing here to laptops with add-in graphics, but even taking these figures in isolation, this is clearly unplayable. Watch Dogs Legion at 1080p, it's the same story, an average of 15 and a low of 4. However, and more importantly to our mind, in PC Mark 10 battery test, this laptop absolutely stomps the field with a monumental battery score. The battery isn't particularly large and is rated at 75 watt hours, and yet it provides all day battery life by any definition of that term. And no doubt you're wondering, how does this brand new processor with a dedicated NPU for AI workloads handle those AI workloads? And indeed, how might we test such a processor? The answer at the moment, among other things, is to use Procyon. This is a new office suite from UL, and it's replacing their existing PC Mark 10 suite. You will note within Procyon, there is a dedicated AI section. And these benchmarks were recently referenced by AMD talking about their Ryzen 7 8840U laptop processor and comparing it to Core Ultra 7 155H. You will notice there are no actual numbers on these benchmarks. It's a relative thing, 1.44X and 1.61X. You will also note they talk about the Procyon AI bench float 32 and float 16 figures. They don't specify whether these tests are run on the CPU or the GPU, let alone the NPU. So there's some room for confusion here. We pressed ahead and ran some tests and these are the results. The Core Ultra 7 155H, float 16 on CPU, 11. Float 32 on CPU, 20. Float 16 on GPU, 163. Float 32 on GPU, 139. And of course we had no reference points, so we didn't know whether these scores were good, bad or indifferent. To resolve the matter, we turned to an ASUS ZenBook UX435EG, which runs an 11th gen Intel Ice Lake processor, specifically the Core i7-1165G7. The Core i7-1165G7 has a quad-core processor with hyperthreading, so 4 cores, 8 threads, nothing to compare with Meteor Lake, or so we thought. In the CPU test, float 16 we got 22, CPU float 32, 49, GPU float 16, 106, and GPU float 32, 95. I'm sure you can appreciate those figures made absolutely no sense to us, so we fired off a bunch of emails to AMD to ask them how they had tested their processor against the same Intel processor we have in this laptop, to Intel to ask them whether those figures made any sense, and to UL to ask about Procyon. AMD hasn't yet responded, that was two weeks ago. Intel came back to say, make sure your drivers are up to date and also Windows Update is up to date. And in fact, we found that that very day there was indeed an update for Windows 11. And furthermore, we discovered today, so a few days after we finished benchmarking, that Windows Update is attempting to update, in inverted commas, the graphics driver for Intel Arc graphics, which in fact would be a downgrade. We updated Windows and we also updated Procyon itself. This update apparently had no effect on results, but we're not so sure about that. And UL themselves came back with an interesting point. They said, you need Intel Open Vino. And the thing is, the tests we'd run were all on Microsoft ML. Apparently we've been using the wrong AI framework for our benchmarking. 
I noted that Intel hadn't said anything about that to us, despite the fact I'd sent over a load of screenshots. Put that to one side. I hadn't seen Intel open Vino in Procyon, but now after the updates, either my eyesight suddenly fixed itself or suddenly open Vino as part of the benchmark suite. It was time to run some new figures. CPU float 16 is now 45. CPU float 32 is 47. GPU float 16 is 314. GPU float 32 is 317. The NPU on float 16, 275. And on float 32, also 275. And the reason I haven't put those figures into charts is because I don't know how to make head nor tail of them. At the moment, as far as I'm concerned, benchmarking AI it's a moving target. No doubt in time it will make sense, but right now this is brand new technology and we simply don't have any solid feel for what is good, bad or indifferent. And you'll appreciate all that makes it rather tricky to come to a solid verdict on the Intel Core Ultra 7155H. And that is of course what we're looking at here today. I have an ASUS laptop sent me by Intel, but it's really all about the processor. Let's go through my pros and cons. Pros, the good points. The battery life is absolutely excellent. It offers decent value for money. As I say, this precise SKU I cannot find on sale, but 1300 to 1400 pounds, that strikes me as very fair. The OLED screen, it's really lovely to use. The fact it's touchscreen to me is a complete irrelevance, but the actual screen, I like a great deal. And the build quality and the form factor, I like it a great deal. Cons, the negative points. The AI side of things, as I've explained at some length, the jury is still out. I just don't know. It might be this hardware is absolutely excellent and I simply haven't got round to using it in the correct manner, but right now I cannot offer a verdict. The cooling can get noisy if you ramp up to a higher power profile. On the plus side, I saw no reason to want to do that. The median normal profile works absolutely fine and was a good balance between power and heat and cooling. I would not tamper with that setting myself. Finally, Core Ultra 7 compared to previous gens of processors, at the moment it seems quite uninspiring. An awful lot has changed under the bonnet. As I said, Intel's been talking to us about Meteor Lake for over a year. There is a huge amount beneath the surface, and yet when it comes down to straightforward grunt work like Cinebench, it's just a processor. Again, the AI side of things is bound to make a difference in time, but right now, generationally, it's not that inspiring. Overall, I'm impressed by the usability of the laptop and the battery life, but the outright performance is mediocre. Having said all that, it's an 8 out of 10 and it's a worth buying.